All right, we're going to get started. Good morning. It is great to be with you all. Great to see you this morning. Uh, those of you joining us on Facebook Live, welcome. It's good to have you joining us as well. Um, have a few announcements uh, to go over uh, with you. First of all, we do have Sunday school normally meeting at 9.45 uh, in the back classroom, back corner classroom. However, next Sunday, which is Christmas morning, December 25th, we will not have Sunday school. However, we will have our regular church service at 11 o'clock here. So please join us for church at 11 o'clock, but no Sunday school. Um, also, a reminder that we are going Christmas caroling uh, this afternoon as a church. Uh, we will meet here at 4 and go out caroling. And then we will head, head over to Kathy Scully's for a time of fellowship and treats. I'll get you your announcements in just a moment, so don't think I forgot about you. <laughs> um, there, uh, there is prayer meeting this Wednesday at 1.30 in my office. So if you're available, we'd love to have you join me uh, in my office for prayer. Uh, that's at 1.30 again. Uh, men, there is no men's group this Friday, uh, December 23rd. Um, however, we will be meeting on Friday, December 30th at Joe DeLeon's house, uh, where we'll be reading and discussing Matthew chapter 26. And again, just uh, mark your calendars before I um, have a couple other announcements. Um, Saturday, December 24th, that's this coming Saturday, we have our Christmas Eve service at 4 p.m. And then looking further ahead on Sunday, January 8th, we have our 2023 planning meeting right after church. Uh, pizza lunch will be provided. It will be back in the fellowship hall. Um, so I want to invite you to join us for that. Um, so a couple other announcements from Kathy. Uh, number one, I would not really like to have to I just want to make it clear, too, uh, if you're coming, caroling, if you're planning on coming and you don't have a finger food, don't stop that from, you know, don't be like, oh, I don't have a finger food, so I can't go over to Kathy's um, afterwards. No, no, no. Please come, and we'll just enjoy a time of fellowship. Whatever food we have there, we have there, um, and we'll just enjoy our time together. So uh, that's wonderful. Uh, just a reminder again that uh, because the Christmas tree is up there uh, by the door on the way out, uh, the offering plate, if you're looking for it, is under the big bulletin board. And uh, that is all the announcements that I have for this morning. And so if you would go ahead and stand, we will join together in worship singing. <coughs> Quite well, but it's good enough. Mm -hmm. And the 
And you may be seated. <laughs> Laura Jane and Penny and Maggie and Talia, you can say no. But when I invite you up, we're going to light the candles up here. So if you want to come up and light the candle, you can. Otherwise, you don't have to come up when it's time, okay? It's totally up to you. This morning, our scripture is, by the way, good morning. It's nice to see all of you. Good morning. <laughs> and good morning to all of you watching online. We're glad that you were able to join us through um, the internet. That's exciting that we could be together that way. This morning's scripture is found in Luke 2. So, Luke 2.15 through thank you I, I'm just going to have to get those little glasses called cheaters so that makes the thing bigger but I didn't get them yet okay so 215 when the angels had left them and gone into heaven so this is after the angels um, gave the message where Jesus was the shepherds said to one another let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about so they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger and when they had seen him they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. So. snapshots of her baby when he was little, right? And as he grew, and things that she treasured in her, in her heart are now in this awesome album, right? These things that, these are some pretty good pictures that kids, so, you know, here's your pastor as he's growing up. He's getting bigger, right? And so the mom, Mary Lou, just like the mom, Mary, in the Bible, had things that God did in her son's life, and just fun things, too. So she treasured those things up in the maybe. house and Pastor Ryan's in his room and he's just talking to God. Just he and Mary Lou says, Who are you talking to? I'm talking to Jesus. So he's just talking away. And there's other little miracles that happen all along the way in your pastor's life that he can now kind of look at this album because his mom took snapshots of that all point the way to Jesus. In fact it's not just Pastor Ryan, but if you noticed the, the slides that Miss Linda put together today, there is like a snapshot, I believe it's of your mom and you, when she is passing. Jesus met you in that moment. It was on the slide, right? So it's a snapshot in her life of Jesus meeting her and what could I, I can only imagine it's really hard, right? We have times in our lives where Jesus has met us where we're at. And so my encouragement to all of us, to us little people and big people, is to take a snapshot of that story in your heart and mind so that you can review it the way that God has worked in your life. Because sometimes we kind of forget that God loves us so, so much. And this Sunday is the Love Sunday. And we can see in that picture of scripture where, um, you know, Mary must have been just kind of blown away of all these things that are happening, right? She's a young woman. And it says she treasured them in her heart. And so we want to treasure our God moments in our hearts, like little snapshots so we can look through and review how God's met us in all the, the good spaces and the hard spaces, all the spaces, right? Let's have the kids come up. You guys want to light a candle. If you want to, come up. If you're like, eh, it's not my thing to be in front. No worries. So let's have the... I, I, I wanted the girls out. Sorry. Sorry. I had boys, and I had girls, and I had boys again. Now I have girls. Yeah. Good job. 
the good job you did. And then we actually did a lot of orders. So the next one is the Joy Candle. She's so nice. So let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for how you love us all the time, in all the ways, whether we notice it and take the snapshots or not, whether we store those snapshots up in our heart and review how you've uh, been with us every step of the way or not. We just praise you and thank you for the love that you've given us through your son um, during this Christmas time and throughout the rest of the year. Help us to be kind of um, curious and excited about the ways you're working. And then when you do something, that we have the eyes and ears to see it and then treasure them like Mary did in her life so that we can look over those moments again and remember your goodness and your faithfulness and your love no matter the season, no matter what's happening. In your precious name, amen. amen. It is that wonderful reminder of how much God loved us through Jesus Christ, the son that he gave to us. And through what Jesus did, we are not just ants crawling around on planet Earth, but we, through Jesus, through our belief and our faith in Him, are adopted as children of our Heavenly Father. That's how much He loves us. And so, as a result, He, he asks us, He encourages us, He welcomes us to come to Him with our prayers. And so we have an opportunity right now to come before God as a congregation and lift up our prayers. If you feel comfortable doing so, I want to encourage you to pray out loud with us during this time. If you're not comfortable praying out loud, no problem. I want to encourage you to just pray silently with us. And maybe you're here with us this morning, maybe you're with us online and you feel like, I just don't know what to pray or I'm not even sure how to pray. Again, no problem because the scripture tells us that the Spirit will pray on our behalf. So let's go before God now in prayer together. Oh Lord, it is so good to be in your house, to fellowship with one another, to praise you, to lift up praise to you through song, through fellowship, through your word, and through listening and learning from you. Lord, again, we just praise you for this time of season and, and where we, again, just remember and focus on <laughs> the love you have for the whole world that you gave your only begotten Son as we celebrate the coming birth of Jesus. Well, remembrance of the coming birth of Jesus. And Lord, through Him, through Jesus, we again give praise that we, those who believe in Him, are adopted as your children. And you invite us to come to you and bring to you our prayers, not just our prayers of request, but our, our prayers of praise, our prayers of thanksgiving. And so, Lord, hear us now as we pray to you as a congregation and lift our prayers to you.
We go to give thank you and praise you for the time to gather together to worship you. Lord, I pray for those that, especially during this time of season, might be uh, a very difficult time, whether it's because of the loss of a loved one or, or just life circumstances that make this a difficult time. Lord, I pray that you, first of all, that they would feel surrounded by your love and your spirit. Lord, that you would bring others around them to just love on them, to care for them, that they would not feel alone during this time. Pray for those who are traveling for safe travel, travel mercies. Again, for many who are not feeling well um, with all kinds of different illnesses. Pray for healing for them and restoration. And Lord, again, we pray this morning that you would open our ears and our hearts and our minds to hear from you what you want to teach us this morning. And in all that we do and all that we are, both individually as well as as a congregation, may you be glorified. And we lift this to you now and pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, children, you are dismissed to Children's Church. And as they head out, we'll have the scripture. continue with our worship singing.
for be it from me to not be me. Even when my eyes can't see, and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Again, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to today's passage, which is Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. And again, I just want to encourage you to come at this scripture with fresh eyes, with a fresh mind. It's a scripture that many of us have heard every Christmas and other times as well. And I just want to encourage you to to come with fresh eyes and a fresh mind, to hear from God something new today. It is one of the passages that I will tell you very quickly that um, as I was studying it, God just taught me so much. And so we're going to look at one part today, and then I'll tell you right now, it's kind of a foreshadowing. Uh, there's a small section we're going to look at uh, on Christmas Eve, and then a small section, different section we're going to look at next Sunday at Christmas morning, because there's so much richness and so much from this passage. Uh, so today, the sermon title is The Lamb Keepers, and so let's start together in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20, starting in 8. And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby keeping watch of their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, 
Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. In the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. <coughs> There's another person that was known as a brilliant young boy, a, a child prodigy, the crown jewel of Vienna. By the time he was five years old, he had written an advanced concerto for the harpsichord. Before he turned ten, he had composed and published several violin sonatas and was playing from memory the best works of Bach and Handel. After his 12th birthday, he composed and conducted his own opera and was awarded an honorary appointment as concertmaster with the Salzburg Symphony Orchestra. Now, I personally had the privilege, while in Vienna in 1990, of touring the palace grounds in Salzburg and listening to some of his works being played by an orchestra there. I was in the very hall where this brilliant musician, as a young boy and a guest of Austria's queen, once conducted the orchestra himself. He died when he was only 35 years old. And before his brief life ended, he had written cantatas, operettas, hymns, oratorios, 48 symphonies, Six hundred works in all. His name was Johannes Chrysostomus Wolfgangus Amadeus Theophilus Mozart. <laughs> now, with a long name like that, he had to be destined for greatness. But also with a name like that, he would certainly be made fun of on the playground. The tragedy is that Mozart fell from his beginnings as a to an impoverished, obscure young man. His fall from greatness was so swift and so devastating that by the time he died, he virtually had no friends, no true friends. He was living in poverty. different to his burial, and only a few people came to the church for his funeral. And then, because of a sudden storm, they never went to the gravesite. And by the time anyone bothered to inquire, the location of his grave was impossible to identify. The unmarked grave of Mozart, who was perhaps the most gifted composer of all time, was lost forever. What a tragedy to lose such influence, prestige, and wealth. To literally go from riches to rags in a matter of years. One more recent example would be the brilliant businessman William Durant at the ranch, who single-handedly created General Motors. It is said that more than 50 men became millionaires by joining his team. Unfortunately, however, through a series of poor decisions, Durant eventually lost most of his fortune and then control of his company. 
in spite of all his valiant efforts, he eventually lost his bid for power and went bankrupt. The last job that he had before he died in 1947 was managing a bowling alley in Flint, Michigan. And at that time, he was too poor to even own one of the several million cars that had been made by the company that he built. Again, what an incredible reversal of fortune. However, all of these types of stories that history could divulge pale in significance when you consider the story of God the Son. He gave away the splendor of heaven and the adoration of his creation in order to come down to earth and live like a human. Now, if we were God, or maybe I should only speak about myself, but I'm going to kind of say we, because I think I'm not alone in this. If we were God, we would have at least arranged to land on satin sheets. <laughs> Yet he chose to be placed on prickly straw in a feed cup. We would have made sure that we had the finest positions around us. Yet he chose to be born where the only attendants were animals with their accompanying smell of manure in a dank, dark stable. We would have been born into one of the most prestigious, well-connected families in Jerusalem. Yet he, the king of heaven, chose to be born to impoverished peasants whose carpentry business barely eked out in existence. He, by his own will, by his timeless counsel, went from riches to rags in the greatest reversal of fortune in the history of all time. So again, I invite your attention back to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been exploring the gems of truth related to this reversal of fortune in the birth of Jesus Christ. Bethlehem was overrun with people who were crowding back into the village of their forefathers in order to register their current family members. And this was ordered by Caesar Augustus, a man who was being heralded as the savior of the world. And last week, we watched a young couple named Mary and Joseph make the best of the worst of conditions. They found shelter in a Bethlehem stable, which was more than likely a shallow cave. Caves were commonly used in that region to provide shelter for the animals of travelers. And it was in that cave that Mary gave birth to Jesus. There were no doctors or nurses, no friends, or even a midwife to help this frightened teenage girl deliver her son into the callous hands of a teenage carpenter named Jim. In their hometown of Nazareth, if everything had gone according to plan, which it obviously had not, the birth of a son was cause for celebration. The proud parents would call all of their friends and relatives. The custom during this time was for the father to hire, hire musicians to come to the home to play music to celebrate the birth of the baby boy. Mary and Joseph could not have felt more alone than at this time. They swaddled their baby by wrapping strips of cloth around his individual limbs as well as around his entire body. Their cradle was Joseph's cloak or perhaps some fresh straw arranged in the corner of a feeding trough. This trough was probably cut along the wall of the cave, which was a typical arrangement in that day. And there were no friends to celebrate with him or to congratulate him. And there certainly were no musicians coming to the stadium to sing. On the other hand, God the Father had arranged for some musicians after all, not to mention a host of new friends. So let's discover what God had in mind as we dig deeper into the passage that we read. 
beginning at verses 8 to 11. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Now, this is absolutely astounding for a, a number of reasons. And I want to just share a couple of them with you. First of all, it is astounding because of who God would disregard that night. It's astounding because of who God would disregard that night. If you were assigned the public relations nightmare of adequately announcing and advertising the birth of God the Son, you would begin by making a list of everyone who ought to know. Then you would make sure that they, in some way, found out. But God disregarded everyone and anyone that we might have put on that list. God bypassed announcing the news to the educated, the religious, the elite, the politically connected, the wealthy, and the powerful. He did not announce it in the courtroom of the Sanhedrin, nor in the temple in Jerusalem. He did not have someone send a memo to Caesar Augustus saying something like, you think you're the savior of the world? You just wait. Nothing. The second astounding thing is not only who God would disregard that night, but even more, who God would dignify that night. Who God would dignify that night. The Bible informs us in verse 8 that the most unlikely people to ever be given the news of Christ's birth were indeed notified. Again, we read, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. Now, it's important to understand, maybe you've heard this many times before, but at this particular time in Jewish history, the only people considered lower than shepherds were lepers. And this was because shepherds were unable to keep all of the regulations of the scribes and the Pharisees. There were regulations such as washing hands at certain times and never touching blood or a dead animal. These were things that fit well within the shepherd's job description of delivering lambs, fighting off wolves, and eating outside on the hillside without the benefit of purified water for cleansing. According to the Mishnah, which was the book of Jewish writings, that codified scribal law. Shepherds were under the ban. That is, they were considered unclean. They could not worship at, nor even enter the temple. They were religious outcasts. By virtue of caring for their sheep seven days a week, day and night, they lived in violation of some religious custom or law at all times. They also worked on the Sabbath, since obviously the sheep did not take a day off. <laughs> they were under the ban and were disqualified from worship, yet they were the first to officially worship the Son of God. Look at whom God disregarded and whom God dignified. I also find it fascinating that Jesus is referred to as the good shepherd by himself in John 10, 11, referred to as the chief shepherd by Peter in 1 Peter 5, 4, and referred to as the great shepherd in Hebrews 13, 20. Shepherding, in fact, has become a metaphor for a life of service and calling to <coughs> ministry. It's the title that Christ chose to give to those who serve the church, lead the church, and feed the church. Of all the titles he could have bestowed on this God-ordained office of loving leadership and careful feeding, he chose the title Poemus, 
plainness, or shepherds. However, when the Apostle Paul summarized the offices given as gifts to the church in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, he used the term poemonist to refer to what we call the pastoral office. Poemonist literally means those who feed and is translated shepherds or pastors. A name that is now claimed with great joy was once an indictment and a blight on a group of people. I think it's also significant to know that shepherds were not allowed to be witnesses in any Jewish court of law. They were considered unreliable because they were not men of the temple. They were unclean and unworthy of bearing testimony before others. Yet, God chose the shepherds to be the first to testify of his son's birth. At the very beginning of his son's earthly life, one cannot miss the grace of God. Look at who he disregarded and look at who he dignified. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things. Let me say one more thing about these shepherds before we move on. The text tells us that they were in the vicinity of Bethlehem. Bethlehem was only six miles south of Jerusalem. It was the rural outskirts of the holy city. And Jerusalem, of course, would swell with several million Jews during Passover as they came with their lambs to sacrifice in celebration of their deliverance from Egypt. You may remember the story from Exodus chapter 12 when the death angel came killing the firstborn of every family, including Pharaoh's family. And the only way to stay the death angel was to put lamb's blood on the doorposts of their homes. Those who had the blood of the lamb were safe as the angel passed over. Well, that event began the tradition of this annual celebration Josephus, a first century Jewish historian, records that approximately 250,000 lambs were killed and eaten during the annual Passover feast in Jerusalem. Now, where did all those sheep come from? Many people did raise their own, but the temple also raised sheep, as well as other animals, which were sold to worshippers who came without an animal to sacrifice. Could these shepherds this night have been on the temple payroll to watch over sheep destined for temple sacrifice? Mm -hmm. I believe this is the case. One of the most confirming pieces of evidence is a rule recorded in the Mishnah. It was stated in printed law that any animals found between Jerusalem and a small village nearby were to be available at any time for sacrifice in the temple of Jerusalem. And that little village's name was Bethlehem. These shepherds were most likely temple shepherds. They were keeping watch over sheep that were destined to become one of the thousands upon thousands of lambs headed to the altar to atone for the sins of the people. Now this, to me, just adds to the beauty and significance, significance of God's announcement. He announced the birth of the final sacrificial lamb to men watching over sacrificial lambs. He announced to men who were considered sinful and out of fellowship with God that the ultimate Passover lamb had been born and his blood would cleanse sinners and bring into fellowship those who were outcast from God. 
the lamb keepers, were the first to hear that the lamb had just been born. This displays a volume of rich truth that reveals the wonderful, deep, condescending grace of God. Mm-hmm. And that's just verse 8. <laughs> verse 9 is where things really start to get good. Let's look quickly at that verse. It says, An angel of the Lord appeared to them. By the way, angels have not been seen for 500 years. For 500 years, no angel has been, been seen by any human on earth. And then suddenly, there are angels showing up everywhere. Or so it seems. The angel Gabriel came to Zacharias in Luke chapter 1, verse 19. Gabriel came to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Gabriel seems to be one of God's chief messengers to humans. And it was Gabriel who spoke to Daniel back in Daniel chapter 8, verse 16. And again to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verse 21. And I don't have evidence of this. I don't have proof. But I believe it may have even been Gabriel who who was speaking to the shepherds. Well, notice further in verse 9. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. You can actually track the phrase, the glory of the Lord, through the Bible, and note that for centuries, the glory of the Lord had not shone anywhere. It had departed. It had left the temple. It had left the people. There was no Shekinah glory of God in the Holy of Holies. Because of disobedience and rebellion, the glory of the Lord was gone. And now, suddenly, angels are appearing and the glory, the Shekinah glory of God is surrounding these shepherds in its brilliance. The text tells us, that the shepherds were terrified. Continue to verses 10 and 11. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. <laughs> That's easy for you to say. <laughs> I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. And that, to you, is a wonderful expression, by the way. It's personal were born to you. And that message was not only for the shepherds, that's for each and every one of us today. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now there are three titles or names given in verse 11 for Jesus. It was known and used in the Gentile world. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, Caesar Augustus claimed this title for himself. Same. And with each name or title, we get even more specific. The second title is Christos, or Christ. This title was especially understood by the Jews. It meant anointed one and was specifically related to the Messianic office. Only the Messiah could claim the title of Christ. And the last title was a summary of it all. It was breathtaking in its claim. And the last title was Lord. Kyrios, or Lord, was the Greek counterpart of the Hebrew term Yahweh. In fact, throughout the Greek translation of the Old Testament, more than 6,000 times Yahweh is translated curious or the Lord. Lord means God. The angelic messenger was telling us, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you who is the anointed one who is none other than God. And that's why the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that in order to be saved, you must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the visible expression of deity. 
One day, when we look into the face of Jesus, we will indeed be looking into the face of God. Well, now notice verse 13. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Wait, let's pause up for a moment. Wait, I, I thought the angels were singing. But verse 13 says that the heavenly host appeared praising God and saying, not singing. Well, this caused me to go back and I just want to share the original word that's translated as praising is the verb anio. It is rarely used in the Greek New Testament. However, it is often used in the Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint for the verb Hallel. And that Hebrew verb means to praise primarily through singing. Anio was interchangeable with Hallel. Both words refer to praising God through song. And so verse 13 could be translated, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God with these words. And then, verse 14, we are given clearly and in poetic form the lyrics of their song. Look at that verse. It says, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. We know from Job chapter 38, that angels sang at the dawn of creation. We also know from Revelation that the citizens of heaven sing to the Lamb and the angels join with them. So at this significant moment of the incarnation, the angelic host burst forth and sang. Now, most likely, I wasn't there, I'm not that old. <laughs> but most likely, it was not exactly Handel's Messiah. Perhaps you have heard snippets of the singing of a rabbi, or, or heard an Orthodox Jewish group singing at Israel's Wailing Wall or right at the festival. It's a chanting type of singing that is mostly monotone. It's beautiful to their ears, but strange to ours, simply because it's not a type of singing that we're used to. And I believe, from everything I've studied, I believe that the angels most likely were singing that type of song in Luke chapter 2. It's not like you have the big angels who are singing bass and the little angels who are singing tenor. <laughs> it was a poetic, monotone chanting, swelling and praising. This unnumbered host of angels must have shaken the ground with their chanting, as well as terrified the shepherds with holy wonder. Well, now look at verses 15 and 16. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. The verb translated as found means literally to discover after searching. And what was the sign? A baby? Mm, not exactly, because perhaps there were several babies born that night. Mm. But this baby was lying in a manger, a feed trough. This was not the custom. This was poverty stricken. Continue verses 17 through 20 as we close. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Mm -hmm. Notice that the shepherds are now glorifying and praising God. And that is what the angels were doing earlier. The first century land keepers were fast wilderness. God could send more angels, so why doesn't he? Why doesn't he write the message of his son's authenticity in the clouds? 
Why doesn't he shake the earth with the chanting of angels again and again and again? He could, but he has chosen to use ordinary, plain, sinful, forgiven, once outcast, once alienated from worship, now redeemed from sin and guilt, now in fellowship with God the Father, believers. For today, we who believe that Jesus is God have within our hearts the Lamb of God. We today are 21st century keepers of the Lamb. And if you will go ahead and stand, we will have our closing worship song and then our benediction. Mm -hmm. Benediction, just a reminder, we would love to have you join us at 4 o'clock as we go caroling, and then after caroling, the fellowship and food at Kathy's Spelling says. And now receive the benediction, which comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.